Welcome back to our series on Bach's Orgelbüchlein. Today we're going to look at the very first choral prelude in the set, that's Nun kommt der Heiden Highland. I think it's absolutely no coincidence that this is the first piece in the set. It's a great Advent hymn. It's a very natural place to start because the set is absolutely a liturgical collection and Advent comes at the beginning of the hymn book. And in addition to that, the hymn itself is perhaps one of the best known of the Advent chorales and was consistently number one in the hymn book in the 18th century, as indeed it has been in Norway also until very recently. But Bach also has plans, I think, in terms of this book. He is quite deliberate in what he puts where. We've already seen that the very last piece in the collection, Ach wie frischtisch, Ach wie nischtisch, has a particular significance in that respect. It's about the transitory nature of life, which disappears like a river flowing away or like a mist dissipating in the morning. And the piece itself doesn't so much end as just stops in mid-flow. And you can almost hear Bach chuckling to himself as he writes the very last note of Orgelbüchlein, which makes you think, what? Was it finished? The Orgelbüchlein itself has a structure that Bach puts on it. So here we are opening with this great Advent hymn. How is the piece itself put together? Well, as is the case in nearly all the Audley Buchlein preludes, we have the melody more or less undecorated across the top and a figuration which is distributed between the hands and feet below. The melody itself has just a written out decoration in bars one and eight. And in addition to that, uh, as Bach often does, Jumps in the melody are levelled out with passing notes in between. But although the melody otherwise is relatively undecorated, it's probably more difficult to hear it than is often the case in Olga Büchlein because of the complexity of the other parts and the density of them. And so, as in all cases, we need to be very much aware of the choral melody, perhaps in this case, even more so. And if it's the case that this is a hymn tune that isn't sung in whatever tradition that you come from, then, then you really need to get to know it well. So to bring out those phrases, it's useful, as we've said elsewhere, to build in a very deliberate, a very clear break between the phrases. So where the phrase endings are on a minim, then I suggest probably it's a useful thing to change the minim to a dotted crotchet and have a quaver rest. And as I always suggest, write it into the music if that helps to remind you, and ideally tie it into something else that's happening in one of the other parts so that it's one less thing to think about. So here I've written the piece out with the choral melody in red and with the final minim in each phrase, shortened, as I say, to a dotted crotchet and a quaver rest. However you choose to do it, have those phrases in mind. Here it is again with long phrase marks written in. And a good tip is to sing the choral melody, uh, to yourself of course, while playing, because that will automatically make sure that you really put it across. We've already said that there is a figuration distributed between the hands and the feet which maintains a constant semi-quaver motion. This particular kind of figuration, in this case, is what is commonly known in German as gebrochen or in French as stilbrise, which is the kind of way that you would play a lute or a guitar. That is to say, where chords are broken into their relative elements. We said in the introductory video that each of the preludes in the set has got its own distinct figuration. And it's probably Bach's intention in doing this to give us almost like a toolbox of figurations that we can use so that when we are making chorale preludes on different hymns, whether this is in terms of improvisation or of composition, then we can use these different ideas and draw on them 
to make our own pieces in the style of Audrey Bichelet. But if you think about how this particular figuration, the broken up figuration, would be played on, for example, a guitar, then we, re we immediately think that the semiquavers are not necessarily going to be absolutely metrical, especially perhaps in that opening bar where the initial chord is unfolded for us. So registration. If you listen to different performances of this work, you'll be struck by the enormous disparity of styles that you'll hear. So some organists will play it on full organ with trumpets and mixtures and pedal reeds and all sorts of things, a very grand style, while others will play with flutes and a very introspective style. Which of those is right? How should we decide? Well, I think in many respects both are right. It depends on how you are looking at this particular hymn. You'll remember that the prelude has the function of introducing the hymn, both in terms of introducing what the melody is going to be, but also commenting on its content, commenting on what the hymn itself says. And this hymn, Nun kommt der Heiden Heiland, says two completely opposing things at the same time. The last verse is a doxology which says, um, praise to God the Father, praise to God the Son, praise to God the Holy Spirit, now and forever. And there you see the grand style, the trumpets and the mixtures. They belong to that. But if you look at the first verse, it speaks of the Saviour of the world coming as a small child born of a virgin, and the whole world wonders why God should have come to us in such a way. And that puts a completely different perspective on the content of the hymn. Here we have quiet wonderment, and therefore the, the flutes. And that whole disparity is summed up really in verse 6 of Luther's hymn, which reads, Da du bist dem Vater gleich, für hinaus den Sieg in Fleisch. Dass dein ewige Gottes Gewalt in us den kranke Fleisch erhalt. So there you have it in alternate lines. The first and the third lines speak of Christ in terms of the glory of the Father, and the second and the fourth lines in terms of the frailness of Jesus' humanity. Obviously, you can't do both. You can't play both the glory and the quiet wonderment. You have to pick one or the other. Last time in this series, I had a choice to make of just the same sort. I went for the lively and the celebratory style. So this time I'll do the opposite and I'll go for the quiet and introspective style. But as I say, there are good arguments for both positions and either would be equally appropriate in many ways. Tempo will also be affected somewhat by your choice of interpretation, your choice of style. I won't speak too much about tempo today, but I'll just refer to the episode which we made specifically on tempo. That was the episode on the Dishabish Gehofet Hat. Well, I see that time is pretty much out, and so we'll just turn to having a look at what this piece sounds like, played relatively quietly on this beautiful Friedobatic organ in Biafra Church today. <laughs> 